Good afternoon. My name is Janine Bryan, and I work at Wush Innovations. We are an engineering firm that is focused on finding solutions and creating innovative solutions to the challenges of fish and fish passage. From the fish perspective, you know, life is all about the life cycle and being able to fulfill that. And they can do a pretty good job, provided that there are not unsurmountable, unsurmountable objects in the way. Those that can be man-made, such as here at Chief Joseph Dam, huge dam and no ability for fish passage. Or here on the Fraser River, where last year Mother Nature decided to do some redecorating and change the, the rock face that's in the circle here and provided all of that rock right back into the river there and created a significant waterfall that was a huge and is a huge challenge for a fish to swim up. Now, many of the dams that we've created, we've provided fish passage. And although that's there, the fish don't always find it very easily. They expend a considerable amount of energy trying to go up those steps and, uh, and find their way. A couple of years ago, we partnered with Critvik to perform a sockeye migration study in which we pit tagged fish at Priest Rapids Dam and then uh, watched how their migration proceeded as they went up the Columbia River. A group of fish were provided the opportunity to, after being tagged, to go back into the ladder and swim the last 15 and a half vertical feet and continue on their way whereas the second group were um, tagged and then placed into a whoosh tube and whooshed over the top, getting into the forebay in approximately about eight seconds. It took a bit longer, a median of 2.9 hours and a mean of 23 hours for those fish to swim up the ladder. In the migration, then we watched as the fish moved up to Rock Island Dam, across Rocky Reach, and all the way up to Wells. And it's pretty obvious that uh, the fish that got sort of the very easy easy way up got there faster further. And um, you know potentially that is because they didn't expend so much energy trying to get up those steps. Here we just the opportunity to see the fish over the course of the week, the green fish went through the whoosh tube, the purple fish went up the ladder, and they just move up up the river a little bit more effortlessly if they were in the whoosh, had been gone through the whoosh tube. Again, looking at that data is the same here, with the hash bars being the whoosh fish, the solid bars being uh, the fish that swim up the ladder, and we're seeing across here, at the, across the bottom, it's time in blue. This is when they get to Rock Island Dam. In yellow, this is when they arrive at Rocky Reach. And in green, when they arrive at Wells, you can see just in the paths going down that the fish that were in the whoosh tube get there by and large a half a day to a day faster than the fish that went up the ladder. So there does seem to be the potential benefit of, of getting and saving that energy. In developing our Woosh Fish Passage systems, we've been trying to implement a way of moving the fish, but by able to do it with selective autonomous passage. And in doing that, we develop what we call the facial recognition system. This is a way of imaging the fish and determining their size while they just slide through the system and doesn't require any handling or any stopping of the fish in terms of its path. We had an opportunity this past year to install our scan, uh, what we call our scanning system, the official recognition system, into the bypass pipe at uh, Bonneville Dam at the adult fish facility. This is a facility where Critfake samples the fish um, and does their, their manual handling and pit tagging and evaluation of the fish. The fish will swim over false weirs, one of two. They'll come down some sorting chutes. And if they're going to be sampled, they go down through the middle. If they're not going to be sampled and be bypassed, 
they come down through the pipes here and then out. And so what we did was substitute a portion of that pipe placed in our facial recognition system and the fish just slid through here, out the pipe, and then back into the ladder. Over the course of the summer, we were able to sample in this way an image, 12,307 fish, many of which were sockeye. This particular image is not a sockeye, but it's showing you how the, the computer will take the images, you take 18 of them total, it generates an, an outline of the fish and then calculates the fork length and the girth off of the cross-sectional area of the fish and, and, and evaluating all of the different images to come with the a consensus. Looking at you know, an, a detailed high-resolution image of one of those, you know, we have a very, very clear picture of, of a sockeye and all of the features that make up what a sockeye is from those spots on the tails to their coloration, etc. In contrast to you know, what we often see in a fish window, this again is not a sockeye, but it is a salmonid traveling through the Rocky Reach um, fish window just here. But it's very it's easy enough to see that there's a fish there, probably that it's a salmonid, but it's much more difficult to do some speciation and, and keep count. System, as a fish enters that scanning, will automatically give it a number It'll record the date, the time, and the calculated size of the fish as it goes through and logs that into the computer. In addition to saving a file that captures all of the images, these 18 different images of, every, of each fish that slides through. So we get an incredible wealth of, of information that can then be processed and looked at. Now, again, I said that the CRIPFIC folks were working at the AFF and they're actually the people that you know, water it up and monitor everything going through and it's just the fish that they chose not to to work up or the fish that ended up in the bypass and those are the fish that went through our system but we they through these different weeks of the year in past 2019 we looked at the sizes of the the average size of the fish on each of these weeks and the number of fish that came through in the different systems and as you can see um, overall, we were actually sampled a greater number of fish and provided very, very similar size data to what, what were being seen by, by manual um, evaluation. Again, we didn't see the same exact fish, so we wouldn't expect necessarily to be the size exactly the same, but as a population average, it comes very close within 1.37 centimeters. And that being said, <laughs> It is, you know, it's, it's nicer to not look at data that way, but to maybe just look at the fish across time and what they really looked like. And again, because we have all of that data immediately inputted and, and logged, we can just go ahead and graph it. And when we do that for the fish that we scanned, uh, we see that we had the dotted line here is actually approximately um, that 43 centimeters, which is the average size fish, uh, but there's you know, relatively no fish that are uh, of the average size because there's really just two populations of fish. And it was wonderful to see how it just it breaks out. This is likely the three-year-olds, and then up top is likely the four-year-olds. So the data can also you know, reflect that here in terms of the size distribution. Right here at about 42, 43 uh, centimeters, showing you've got one population that's smaller and another population that's larger. So these are things that can be done almost instantaneously as soon as the data comes off or definitely daily to be able to evaluate the kinds of fish coming through. And again, you end up with um, a record of all of the fish, multiple images from each one in very nice high definition resolution, clearly able to distinguish uh, a sockeye from a shad. You know, here you even see the, you know, the traditional spot that you see, the large scales, completely different fish. So much so, I looked at so many of these and been able to say that we can even, you know, the fish may not be in the same orientation every time they come through, but we get multiple side views and we can even identify a sockeye by looking at its underbelly and on the under jaw in particular is very unique and distinctive. Get another sockeye.
another one having fun in the stream. And we, and we can see other features in terms of the condition of the fish here. Clearly, this has got some injury, the double injury like this, you know, somewhat reminiscent of pinniped injury. In this particular case, we just see some descaling along the way, some damage to the tail. It's possible that this was a fish that was caught and then released, uh, possibly in a net of some sort. In this case, a very sizable injury, most likely a pit injury and lots of different scrapes. We can really say something about the condition of the fish and make some assumptions or estimations as to what might be happening as it migrates upstream. Of all of those fish that we saw in the uh, our Bonneville database that we created last year, 86% of them, we didn't see any injury on those fish in the post analysis, but about almost 14% of them we did. The majority of those we considered minor, although 4.4% we would say were major. The so major injuries were open wounds and gashes, pinniped bites, long scratches. Descaling that was less than 20%, uh, scrapes, split fins, and small sores we considered minor injuries. Major injuries would be the expectation that they may really influence the ability of the fish to reach the spawning grounds. The minor injuries probably are not going to be that life-threatening. But the technology, as you see, it was very simple. The fish swim through, just slide through. They you know, spend a, you know, less than half a second in there. We we're able to gather all of this information and process it very quickly to have a very rapid readout. The other thing that we can do then is take that scanning scanner and place it in front of our sorting chutes to be able to actually dictate whether the fish go in, down one chute or another and we can direct the fish so we can actually utilize the system to do selective sorting and movement of fish. Again, and this is done by all of the images that are taken. The fish are the fish are logged and counted, they're calculated, their sizes. And this use, information is used for a sorting decision that would direct a fish down one path or another in our sorting system. This past summer, we were able to implement one of these um, full systems. We call it the Woosh Passage Portal. And the fish, once they've gone through the system, are they selectively sorted down one path or another and then moved accordingly. In this particular um, set up the passage portal. This is actually a floating system and where the, the fish would swim up and then pass through. And we position this at actually at Chief Joseph Dam where there is no fish passage at the moment and we did a proof of concept to show that we could actually move fish from the waterway all the way up to the top of the dam. We were, to, we were asked not to put them over the dam and into the forebay but to return them to where they were in the in the in the trail race until uh, they're ready to have uh, a reintroduction. But we did prove the concept that we could move fish up there. It was not soccer that we moved in this case, it was a, uh, a Chinook, but we can move any, any kinds of species up and over and through. I hope this has been useful for you to get a feel for what we can do in terms of our different technologies. Uh, Sakai is just one of the stories, but we've been able to do and apply all of these kinds of technologies to be able to enhance the ability to understand what fish are doing, to automate things, to make them faster, to get to, to provide fish with um, some benefits in terms of safe passage and ben uh, benefits with respect to energy cons conservation as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us through, um, through our website or through uh, myself directly, janine.brian at woosh.com, and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.